welcome to Stuff You Should Know from HowStuffWorks.com. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark, and there's Charles W. Chuck Bryant, and there's Jerry over there. And this is Stuff You Should Know. The, um, the I don't know what edition this is. <laughs> it's a good one, though, I predict. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know much about this, so I was uh, when I found it. I was like, "Wow, this is this is right up our alley." Yeah, this is um, part of what's very frequently called um, a hidden history of World War One. This is not something that a lot of people have known about for very long, although it seems to be picking up kind of academic interest. Mm-hmm. But this idea of people who were disfigured in the war. Um, facial dis- suffered facial disfigurements. Yeah. Um, and I should say, I want to say now before at the outset, um, facial differences is the preferred term. Right. And there's like a whole, there's a whole sea change going on in perception um, and, you know, just being out there with facial differences. Mm-hmm. It's like the antithesis of what we're about to talk about. Right. So hats off to that. Um, but this was a time when there was a, huge sudden uptick in facial disfigurements is what they call them from being at war. Yeah. I mean, uh, world war one was a brand new war. Uh, the industrial revolution brought on, uh, new horrific ways to kill people like the machine gun, the machine gun, and, shells. uh, in trench warfare, they point out in, in both of these articles that I read that, um, people, the soldiers at the time still didn't have a full understanding of just what machine gun meant. Right. And that you don't have time to go poke your head above the trench and look real quick. Like, those bullets are faster than you. Right, you're and not you just dodging. you will get dodging, a face full of them. Right, and you're not dodging one bullet. There's a bunch of them coming. So yeah. Maybe you get out of the way of one, but there's three more headed your way, too. Yeah, so there wasn't, I mean, it sounds weird to, to think of that now, but there was not that full understanding. And a lot of men in World War One had a lot of bad things happen to their face. Yeah, so not just from machine gun fire, from sticking their head up above a trench, but also from those mortar shells. Yeah, artillery. Are, they'd been around for a little while, but they, just prior to World War I, had really been perfected into, like, really destructive instruments. Um, they blew up, and they created a totally different type of wound than a bullet hole does because they're jagged pieces of metal, mm-hmm. iron, steel, and they could, say, tear your lower jaw completely off. Yeah. Um, take off half of your face. Like, they just did all sorts of really weird, horrible things. And that that advancement in um, weaponry, I guess you'd call it, mm-hmm. combined with some advancements in um, battlefield emergency medicine mm-hmm. so that— Saving lives. Yeah. So that there were worse wounds than ever before— mm-hmm. But the potential of surviving a wound like that was also greater than ever before, which culminated in a a huge uptick in people who whose faces had been disfigured by either bullets or shrapnel um, more than anyone had ever seen before in, as far as numbers went. Yeah, there are a couple of doctors in these articles that have quotes, <laughs> and uh, one of them talked about, like, you don't – we didn't see a broken bone. We saw bones that were just shattered. Right. Um at the time, I think another quote talked about it, the the weaponry was outpacing medicine. Yeah. Um, and like you said, they were maybe able to save lives more. Right. But it was outpacing like, well, now what do we do? Right. We don't have the means to do facial reconstruction like they will in the future. And in, in a very weird but also really real way, World War One pushed reconstructive surgery to, to advance by Big leaps time. and bounds just by – all of a sudden having a bunch of people to practice on and try new techniques on, but also having to do that all of a sudden, you know, rather than slowly taking your time, it was like, no, you need to figure this out now. And a lot of surgical techniques advanced, but a lot of people point to World War I as like kind of the dividing line between anything that came before as far as plastic surgery goes and modern plastic surgery really started in World War One, But people have been doing stuff as far as plastic surgery goes for a th- more than a 1,000 years before War, World War One, Or no, about almost 3,000 years, 2,500, 3,500. 
3,500 <laughs> years at least. That's, that's as far as I'm going. I'm the worst at, at figuring out uh, time spans over centuries. Yeah. As you know. Yeah. That's why I never do it. Um, you always leave it to me. <laughs> Uh, I, I usually just say the year, and so you're like, you can figure it out how long ago that was. <laughs> you go. Um, but about 1600 BCE is when we have evidence uh, on paper or papyri, papyri, <laughs> of actual uh, repairing things on the face like that and suturing things on the face. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I believe there was a Hindu doctor named Susrata who developed the first rhinoplasty. Yeah, because in India, um, especially during this time, like I think this is about— This is 500 BCE. So about 2,500 years ago. (laughs) um, If you were uh, caught stealing, you would get your nose lopped off. You could also get it lopped off in war. And it happened frequently enough that it was an Indian doctor at that time who who created the technique of, re, re, like, building a new nose. Uh, your nose could also just fall off mm-hmm. if it was the 1700s and you had syphilis. Yes. Can you imagine something like that? No. Syphilis sounds <laughs> awful. I mean, it would drive you crazy. It would attack your spine. Yeah. But there were also these necrotic lesions called gummos or gummas. Mm-hmm. Isn't that an awful name for something that, that eats your face away, a gumma? Yes. Oh, I got a new gumma today. Look at this thing. Yeah. Um, but it would eat your nose clear off. It would eat your eye out of its socket. It would eat your mouth away. Um, and the the prevalence of syphilis actually was something that kind of pushed um, plastic surgery along as well. Yeah, they started experimenting with skin grafting uh, in the early 1800s. Mm-hmm. Um, the the term plastic surgery didn't actually come mm-hmm. about until the 1800s. But they were, you know, I can't imagine the results were great. But they, you know, they were leading the way all over the world with some things like skin grafts and mm-hmm. plastic surgery. Very rudimentary and crude. But it did pave the way. Yeah, they were figuring out techniques. But again, they didn't have... They didn't have something like World War I to push things for them. They had syphilis, which is something. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, um, they had like cleft palates was one. That was a, a surgery that, that had been not perfected or anything like that. But it, it was a surgery you'd frequently see if you were a surgeon. Mm-hmm. You might be asked to do. But um, World War I, again, just brought on a, a drove of totally different cases that no one had ever seen before. So they had to get clever. And there were a couple of people who kind of came to the fore just as far as the plastic surgery went. There was a guy from New Zealand named Gillies. What was his first name, Chuck? Mickey? <laughs> you knew I was going to say that, right? Yeah. No, his name was uh, Sir Harold Gillies. Yeah. Uh, there were a few people. There were, And we'll, we'll talk about all of them kind of. Uh, as we go here, but Sir Harold Gillies, uh, there was a gentleman named uh, Francis Derwent Wood, mm-hmm. and then there was a woman uh, named Anna Coleman Ladd. Right. And they all <clears throat> contributed greatly to this new cause of this really, really sad cause of these men coming home with these really terrible things that have happened to their face, mm-hmm. and not only like I'm shunned by society, but, like, my kids can't look at me. Right. My wife wants to leave me, and some of these soldiers are like, and she rightfully should want to leave me. Like, how can she even look at me? Right. And it was just such an awful thing to have to live with. And they all chipped in to, um, I mean, I, I call them war masks, basically, like these wound masks. Uh-huh. And they would make, and if you see the pictures of these, it's amazing. They These before and after photos they would make masks, and we'll get into the nitty gritty, but essentially masks to cover these uh, what what they called then disfigurements. Whether it was a missing eye, a missing nose, the lower half of your jaw, mm-hmm. uh, so it wouldn't be something you wore over your entire face. It would just be the part that they needed. Right. So initially, it was um, okay. We can advance plastic surgery, and that's where Harold Gillies came in. Mm-hmm. He founded a hospital at Sidcup, which is outside of London from what I understand. And it was um, – that was where you would go if you were British to get your um, – to get plastic surgery. And you could go stay there for like two years basically getting a series of surgery and a series of surgery, just one after the other, mm-hmm. um, recovering, new surgery, recovering, new surgery. And if 
they couldn't quite do it, um, they would send you over to Francis Derwent Wood, who we'll talk about in a second. But there were there were limits to plastic surgery. And when plastic surgery reached its limits, and I guess the soldier's face was still uh, disfigured to the point where he didn't feel like he could return to society, mm-hmm. or society was like, nah, 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 you stay over there, then Francis Derwent Wood and Anna, Ladd, Anna Coleman Ladd came into play. Yeah, he wrote, uh, Gillies wrote, mm-hmm. a, and he, he pioneered a lot of work that they still say is still important to modern plastic surgery. Mm-hmm. Um, and he ended up writing a book, and he, he was the guy that said, you know, before this we were doing things like cleft palates, and all of a sudden we were getting 2,000 patients a day coming in with the most horrific injuries you could imagine. Yeah. And uh, he ended up writing a book called uh, Plastic Surgery of the Face. And if you look at this book, and this article rightfully points out, it's um, it really demonstrates how far they had come and what they were able to do, but also mm-hmm. what they weren't able to do at all at the same time. Yeah. Like their limitations, even though he was doing, for the time, really, really advanced work. Yeah, I mean, stuff where, like, you cut out a piece of skin – and sew it to another part of your skin Mm -hmm. so that there's blood flow, and then you cut off where it was originally connected and then sew that part down. And basically you just inchworm skin down the face Mm -hmm. to where you want it. Like they were figuring out things like you have to keep a blood supply going or else it's going to just rot and fall off. Like like really advanced stuff. And like in a lot of cases – they they were able to restore the soldier's face basically back to or some close similar, similarity to what mm-hmm. it was prior to the injury. But again, there were plenty of them where it was just like, we can't do anything for you, man. And that's when they would go. That It was when those cases started to build up, Francis Derwent Wood and Anna Coleman Ladd stepped in. Should we take a break? Yeah. All right, we'll take a break right now. So one thing I want to mention real quick is uh, I don't think we talked about was outside mm-hmm. Sidcup or in Sidcup where Gillies had his hospital. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had – there were so many men coming through there. They had – in the town, they had certain benches painted – were they painted blue? Yeah. Uh, and if the, there was a bench painted blue, it was sort of a – I guess you – for lack of a better word, a warning to society like here's where these patients will be sitting and you might want – to not sit there and look at them. Right. It was like a horrible thing to do, but it was just sort of emblematic of like what these men had to go through, like children terrified in public of these people. Mm -hmm. Like they wouldn't put mirrors in these hospitals. Well, yeah, and it was supposedly it was uh, an enormous shock to see yourself. I I can't even imagine it. Like I can't imagine what what it would be like to see your f- face like missing major features because mm-hmm. it, and this was a recurring theme that I saw in a lot of the um, like academic coverage of this is it, like on the one hand what these people were doing was like really great and noble and they were trying to help these people mm-hmm. regain their identity but at the other it's kind of like um, what does it say about society that like these people couldn't come back because they were missing like an eye or a mouth or or something like that? You know, it's right? Like, like a, stay in your house. Right. Like we don't. I don't want my kid to see this. That kind of thing. Yeah, there's a complicated thing going on here. It's complex. It's yeah. not just cut and dry. Like that was heroic. This guy was missing a face. Got to have a face. So they made him a mask to cover up his deformity. Yeah. Um. It, it was. There's more to it than that. You know. I mean, we're at a place now where we're making great strides in acceptance mm-hmm. of of stuff like this. But imagine – it's still bad. Imagine what it was like back then. Yeah. Have you seen that movie Wonder? No. Oh, it's so good. What it's is it? so sweet. It's like um, oh. about a, a little boy with facial differences and yeah, like yeah, him yeah. going from homeschool to school. Yeah, I've heard about it. Um, it's – Heartbreakingly sweet. Yeah. Owen Wilson's his dad <laughs> of doing his Owen Wilson thing. Julia Roberts plays his mom. She yeah. looks great. It's a great movie worth seeing. Um, but yeah, there's a 
there's a whole movement going on. I follow this this account. I think they might be British called Changing Faces. Mm-hmm. And they're all just like out out and proud. Like, this is my face. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I can't do anything about it. I'm not going to do anything about it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, let's let's move from there. Yeah. And uh, it's neat. It's neat to see just that that change, that huge shift from you go stay over here mm-hmm. out of society. Like, society doesn't really feel like it can ask that of people any longer. Whereas before it was like, my wife can't even look at me. She's repulsed by me, and she she deserves to be. Mm-hmm. That's a huge change, you know, and I think that's wonderful. Well, and it was also the same time where you would— uh, where a Kennedy would get lobotomized <laughs> and stuffed in a in a insane asylum right. forever, yeah, never to be talked about again, right? Or you know, people committed family members. So like it was a dark time for humanity. Yes, and we're just now coming out of it a little bit. Well, we've we've come a long way since then, obviously, but it's just amazing how many I don't know how much of this stuff still goes on. Sad. Should we talk about the masks? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so if, if Harold Gillies couldn't do anything for you, um, you would move on to Francis Derwent Wood, who is an artiste, if there ever was one. Yes. So he had a shop uh, called the Tin Noses Shop. <laughs> yeah, he didn't call it that. He didn't? I, I don't know. He may have facetiously, but it was the Tommies, the wounded British soldiers who called it that. Yeah, T-I-N as in you don't have a nose, here's one made of tin. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, they called it the Tin Noses Shop. Yeah, but tech, but the official name was the Masks for Facial Disfigurement Department. Yes. And it was fr- it was founded by Francis Derwent Wood, who, um, he was, like I said, he was an artist and he um, en- enlisted as a private in the medical corps at age 44. Yeah, which is uh, obviously, especially mm. back then, kind of old to do something like that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he found pretty quickly that he didn't get a great duty. He was um, he described it as errand boy chores. Mm-hmm. And he had a knack, though. He was an artist, so he had a knack for coming up with some pretty ingenious things. At first it was splints uh, that were apparently pretty – creative and sophisticated. And then those chattering teeth that just made everybody <laughs> laugh. Those are his. Why, why was that ever a thing? I don't know. Was that supposed to be funny? I guess. Look at those teeth chatter. 70s. I guess so. That was in the Pet Rock, which, by the way, I wanted to do a show on that. Is there a show's worth of material, or is that like a short stuff, you think? I don't know. We'll find out. Yeah, that's okay. a nice tease. Um, maybe we'll come up with a third podcast called Somewhere in Between <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Stuff. <laughs> It's exactly 23 minutes. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, he was doing Aaron Boy stuff, had a lot of creativity. I guess he caught the eye uh, of the people there. And as an artist, they said, you know what? You could actually be very useful in uh, constructing this kind of new idea, which are these, uh, these, and again, this is what they called them back then, like disfigurement masks. Right. They had stuff, they had prosthetics before. Facial prosthetics, but they were made of rubber. They weren't very good. They, the, aesthetically, they were they were utilitarian. Yeah. They were they were meant to maybe help you chew again mm-hmm. if you were missing your lower jaw. Yeah. Um, whatever they were meant to solve the problem of the missing function. This is the opposite of that. Yeah. This is f- cosmetic. I guess you would call very it very much so. Yeah. Um, aesthetic cosmetic. Francis Derwent Wood said. Like I'm like I'm not trying to restore function. That's not the point of what I'm doing. Um, what I'm doing is restoring identity. Somebody put it that he was w- making portraits out of metal. Yeah, they then, call them portrait masks, right? Yeah, yeah. And then putting them on to the person to to basically restore their look back to what it was pre-war. Yes, and they were also uh, very intent at at Wood's shop of. Um, Treating these men with dignity and respect mm-hmm. um, to, uh, I think one of the nurses even talked about how beautiful a face without a nose was. She was which a was sculptor. Interesting. Was um, she? Yeah, it was Kathleen Scott, who was the widow of Robert Scott, Robert Falcon Scott, who died in Antarctica on an expedition. But she was a she was a sculptor who helped out and yeah. was like 
these are people still, and they're beautiful in their own way. Yeah, her quote was, uh, men without noses are very beautiful like antique marbles. Mm-hmm. Which, Which, I mean, all great. of us have seen antique marbles all the time, <laughs> so you know exactly what she meant. Uh, they also said at Woodshop to always look a man straight in the face. Yeah. Remember, he's watching your face to see how you're going to react. So it started when they first would come in there mm-hmm. with being treated like a human being. Right. Uh, which really is is great. Yeah. So uh, he would establish his unit in March 1916, mm-hmm. and uh, by June of the following year, he appeared uh, in the Lancet, the great legendary British medical journal uh, that's still around today. And then eventually, at the end, toward the end of 1917, there was a a Boston-based sculptor in the United States, obviously. Uh, and her uh, previously to being married, she was Anna Coleman Watts, and she was uh, very talented as a sculptor and eventually married a man named Maynard Ladd, who was a physician, and he moved to France with him because mm-hmm. he got a gig with the Red Cross. Yeah, he was uh, like the ch- injured children's corps leader, something like that. Man, what a thing to do. Um and yeah, so they moved to France, and she found out of what Francis Derwent Wood was doing back in England, and she's like, "I'm going to try that here." So with the Red Cross, she set up something called the um, Studio for Portrait Masks in Paris, in the Latin Quarter, and she went to work doing the same thing. Again, this is all pioneering stuff. Like these people were making this up as they went along. There were a couple of trained sculptors who turned during the war turned their talents to restoring facial identity to men whose faces had been disfigured by shrapnel and bullets. Yeah, and by all accounts, um, the uh, lad studio was very much the same way of like trying to set them up for success as humans and treating them with dignity. Her, yeah. her, her place in the Latin Quarter was very beautiful. It was described as a large, bright studio. Uh, plants and ivy on the walls and flowers everywhere. And she wanted to make it, like, I think it's a, it's significant that these were artists and not from the medical establishment. Right. Because they wanted to set up these beautiful places for these men to come and feel good about what's going on there. And I think at the time, like, hospitals were grim. Oh, yeah. And any kind of treatment you got was just, I mean, we've talked a lot about old medicine. It was not a sunny uh, experience in any way. Yeah. Then those horrid like wicker wheelchairs that are the creepiest things ever <laughs> anyone's ever seen. Yeah, so Lad tried to set up a really lovely, cheery, welcoming mm-hmm. space for her patients to come in, which is just great. And there's newsreel footage from that era of Lad working in her studio with one of her patient clients. I don't know what you'd call him. Yeah. But there's, I think he's missing a substantial part of his lower face, mm-hmm. maybe his lower jaw. And she attaches the prosthetic, the mask, and, like, tucks it behind his ears. Like, it hangs on behind his ears, right? Yeah. And um, it's it's the neatest thing. Like, he smiles. Like, he goes from not sad but neutral, but then all of a sudden he smiles, and it's like it was a warm, genuine smile. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's really moving because you can read about all this like we did all you want. And yeah. Like, oh, here's this quote from this person, and this person said this was an amazing thing too, and here's a letter somebody wrote. But seeing that guy smile yeah. when when um, when Anna Coleman Lab puts the, the prosthetic on his face, it says it all. Like, it all comes into to focus what everybody in the articles are talking about. Yeah, and there are a lot of great before and after photos mm. uh, of the, and we'll get in, you know, in, in a few minutes on how they made these things, but there are a lot of great before and after photos. And when you look at these, because initially in today's, in 2018, is you think about, well, these people had a horrific thing happen to their face. And so now they wear a mask like attached by either eyeglasses or hooked over their ears to, to mesh with the rest of their face. And mm-hmm. your first thought is like, how unbelievable did that look? But when you look at these photos... They look really good, and you can only imagine that just that sense of uh, normalcy, yeah. for lack of a better word, meant so much to these men. Yeah, even covering it up, not fixing it, but yeah. just covering, covering it up, up enough to 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 blend in, Yeah, I think is what they were looking for. Pretty extraordinary. Yeah. 
You want to take another break? Yeah, let's do it. We're going to take a break, everybody. We just decided. I don't know if you heard or not. (laughs) And here we go. All right, so let's talk about how these masks were made. Again, they were revolutionary. These people were making it up as they were going along, um, but they hit upon it pretty well right out of the gate. And the big, one of the big differences was that these weren't rubber prosthetics that were meant to restore function. They were metal masks that were meant to restore identity. Yeah, and a little dignity maybe. Yeah. Um, so the first thing that would happen is a uh, lad or you know whoever's working on this because they all, uh, Lad and Wood, both had people they worked with mm-hmm. on their teams. So the first thing they would do is get a photo, obviously, more than one photo of pre-war and what they look like. Because the whole thing is, I don't want to make you look like you looked before, not just, well, let me just fashion you a nose. Sure. It's like, I want your nose to look like your old nose. Right. And uh, so they would get these photos that the people, uh, the patients and soldiers would have to heal completely uh, in order to undergo this process at all. Like, it's not the kind of thing they could do, you know, as they're healing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so they made a plaster cast, and then after that they would make what's called a squeeze, which is like a, a clay version of that cast. Right. And then eventually that would end up in a galvanized mm-hmm. copper mask about the thickness of like a playing card. Right. And the plaster cast that they would make of your face was supposedly just an awful awful process. Sure. Like they would give you a little straw to put in your mouth and like that's how you breathe for as long as they were, they took to make the plaster cast. Yeah. It was pretty bad. It'd be bad anyway, but after you've suffered that trauma to your face, I imagine anything near or around your face would be really uh, disconcerting. Yeah. And let's talk about that. What led up to that? First of all, you were shot in the face. Or hit with shrapnel in the face. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you would be laying there if you went down in no man's land for hours, days sure. before somebody came and got you. You were taken to a um, field hospital and then flown over to England or, or driven over to England or, or by boat. Be quiet, everybody. Um, <laughs> or taken to Paris. Um, and you underwent possibly two years of surgical reconstruction. And then finally, once all your surgeries were healed, you would find yourself in uh, Mrs. Ladd's studio or Francis Derwent Wood's studio getting plaster coated over your disfigured face, Mm -hmm. holding a little straw in your mouth. Yeah. So, yeah, it was was probably not the greatest thing that they've ever experienced. It was probably tied for first with a couple of those other ones along the way for being terrible. Yeah, and like you said, this is after... um Noble but not great result uh, attempts at, you know, doing it the plastic surgery way. Right. So these people are desperate. They, I mean, if you've gone in there to get a portrait mask, you're that's your last stop. Yeah. To try and resume, uh, you know, your previous life, basically. Sure. Or as right. close yeah. as you can get to it. That's a big caveat. All right. So if you had facial hair, if you had a mustache, which uh, a lot of men did back then, um, they would use real hair and add that into the mask. Uh, her, I think it took her about a month to make one of these. Yeah, I don't know if you said or not, but she was credited as by far being the better artist. Like the results she was, were, yeah, really talented, much better coming out of the Lad Studio than out of the Wood Studio. Yeah, but he was faster and more prolific. Yeah, he had a lot more. I think he served a lot more patients. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the end, I believe her shop was only open about a year, and with four assistants, created 185 masks. Mm-hmm. Which, um, again, in the grand scheme of things, is not very many people, but changed all of those lives. Right. You know? So they, so they're from the plaster cast, you said they made a squeeze. A cast is a negative. The squeeze is a positive. Mm-hmm. And then they would use the squeeze as the model for making the cast that, or the mask that they needed. Yeah. Um, and then they would, they would cast it into um, copper. Yeah. One thirty second of an inch thick. Mm-hmm. And then, it, like you said, it would attach by um, spectacles or around the ear. Mm-hmm. And f- uh, Mrs. Ladd, you said she used hair? Yeah. But Wood used, like, he painted his on. 
Yeah. So when you go to look up these photos, they'll have the before and after. Mm -hmm. And on the left, you know, it's sometimes you can't even tell what this man might have previously looked like. Oh, man. Until you look at the right. Yeah. And then it looks, you know, it's a mask, but you're like, you can tell that that's what this guy looked like. And it's a, like, it really is true. The the loss of identity that must happen or I'm must sure. have happened at least back then. Um, and I'm sure now too, where if you undergo a facial trauma, mm -hmm. it's amazing what, how drastically it can change how you look, yeah. your face. It just changes yeah. from what it was before. When you see some of the before, before pictures, so before the injury, mm -hmm. then after the injury, and then after the mask, that before the injury and then after the injury picture, sometimes you're like, how? Like I, I don't see that person in there at all. Yeah. So, yeah, I can imagine, like we said, they kept mirrors out of the ward because seeing yourself like that, especially if you were in the process of undergoing surgery, mm -hmm. I'm sure they were like, you don't need to see this at all, buddy. Just just let us keep working on you, you know? Yeah, one of the, the tougher parts of this process, too, and um, and also most important was matching the skin tone. Right. So, obviously, if you have a mask that mm -hmm. doesn't look like your other, you know, skin uh, tone on the rest of your face, mm -hmm. then it's going to stand out more, and your whole point was to blend in. So she would save that for last and actually fit the mask on the man and and paint it while it was on their face so she could match it as exactly as possible. Right. Uh, I think used a couple of different oil paints at first. Didn't work out. Yeah, they chipped. Yeah, and then landed on enamel, uh, which is – and these things still, you know, we should say it's not like it would last 20 years. Like no. they were – you know, it's a mask you wear every day, so it would get beat up over the years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, wear and tear happened for sure. Um, one of the other things with the paint, too, is apparently the hue was really difficult because on, like, an overcast day, it yeah. might look really lifelike. But then that same hue in sunlight looked, like, dead. So they had to, like, kind of split the difference between the two. So from what I saw, the paint, getting the uh, complexion right was the hardest part for sure. But, yeah, those masks supposedly had a... Uh, life expectancy of just about a couple of years. But the thing is, is after the war, um, Wood's studio closed down, and so did Lad's. Um, and so these men, that was it. They got their mask. It was almost like this weird little pop-up mm -hmm. that happened that went away and never came back. So these men, you know, clung to their masks for as long as they could. And so much so that... Um, they there are there basically aren't any of those masks. No one is like, oh, this is a World War One um, portrait mask. Right. Those are all buried with their owners because those masks became part of their public identity as well. Yeah, I, I bet you there's got to be one somewhere, right? Surely, but I think most of them are probably yeah. buried with their owners. And these, like I said, with Lad, only 185 masks. You were very lucky if you were able to get one of these. Yeah. Because there were, um, I believe, they estimated 20,000. Fate, what they called facial casualties in World War One alone. Right. So out of that number, to only get 185 from like the best artists mm -hmm. working mm -hmm. is uh, not very many people. And they think Francis Derwent Wood created more um, just because he was open longer and he was more prolific or he's faster. But um, they don't have a number. But even still, even if he made three times that, that's nothing compared to how many people had become facially disfigured from inju injuries, right? Yeah, and Ladd, um, she was lauded. She did a lot of interviews um, when she got back to the United States. Uh, in 1932, she was made a chevalier. Nice touch. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. Chevalier of the French Legion of Honor. And uh, she just went back to her you know, her art when she got back to the United States. Yeah, this, this, I want to say this awesome Smithsonian article by Carolyn Alexander who talks about this. Yeah, it's good. It mentions that her busts, like she was a sculptor, right? Yeah. And before her work in the war and after her work in the war, it's actually really kind of generic portraits of people. Yeah. It, like it lacks like the pizzazz and like the human like touch that her actual wartime mask efforts had. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, it's cool. I like her busts. I like I like her style. It looks yeah. weirdly like early twentieth century modern. Yeah, so totally. They're, they're good looking. Uh, and she died in nineteen thirty nine. Um, she died young. She died at sixty in Santa Barbara. Um, Francis Derwent Wood died also young, fifty five. Yeah, fifty five years old in nineteen twenty six in London. 
And uh, he was remembered, obviously, post-war as well, which is great. Uh, public monuments, war memorials, and uh, the Machine Gun Corps in Hyde Park Corner in London mm-hmm. is uh, apparently where one of the most poignant war memorials for him lays. Yeah. Lies? Lows. Sits? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like you said, I mean, 20,000 of these injuries and only, say, several hundred of them received masks. And again, this is a time when society didn't really want you back if you were facially disfigured in the war. So sad. And there was a there was an idea to basically buy some land for disfigured officers mm-hmm. um, to have them just basically go live off the land over here and, and have a nice pension and just stay over here. And those plans didn't come to fruition. Um, and so they were just kind of expected to just go fade away. Just go away. We don't want to see you. In Australia, apparently they had a lot of um, facially disfigured soldiers returning home. Um, a lot of them would just go out and live, into the bu- live in the bush. Yeah. You know? It'd be like living in the woods in, in England or the U.S. Is Okay, I'm going to go live in the woods now because you guys don't want to see my face anymore. And mm. a lot of them committed suicide too, sad, sad to say, or died of suspicious accidental deaths. Yeah, man, like the the stories where you hear about the their kids being frightened of their father and stuff after the war, uh-huh. just heartbreaking. Yeah, and a, that was supposedly a a pretty recurrent anecdote in news, yeah. newspaper articles about this about these studios. Like they're trying to save people because their own kids can't stand to be around them. You know? Yeah, but kids even scared of the <clears throat> mask because, uh, you know, it points out is while they did so much to restore it. The, they were still expressionless faces, right, sure. which, um, you know, could, could creep out a kid for sure. Yes. But we've come a long way. Yes. And wonder is proof positive of that. That's go, right. Go see that movie. It's good. I will. Uh, if you want to know more about facial differences, go check out, um, I don't know, just search facial differences. Check out changingfaces.org and go see Wonder. Why not? It's a good movie. I'll check it out. <laughs> that was the second one was directed to everybody. Oh, okay. Um, and since I said that, it's time for listener mail. Uh, I'm going to call this relative of President Pierce here. Whoa, I'm in trouble. Parentheses, lighthearted. Oh, okay, good. I'm not. <laughs> hey, guys, big fan. I had a baby in August, so I've been behind on the episodes. Finally got to the new short stuff where you mentioned President Franklin Pierce, and I couldn't help but laugh out loud when I heard your disdain for the man. <laughs> Uh, my baby son's middle name is actually Pierce, just like his father and every other male that was born in his family. A tradition that has stemmed since, you guessed it, Franklin Pierce became president. My husband is a great, great nephew of Pierce. The um, best. <laughs> his grandmother actually still owns the presidential China. That's kind of cool. Wow. Uh, every time someone finds out my husband is a descendant of a president, they get so excited. But my husband and all of his family just roll their eyes and exclaim, Oh, he was the worst president. Everyone just remembers Lincoln anyway. It makes me laugh every time that his family doesn't think much of this man any more than the rest of the world. So just take comfort in knowing that your hate on Pierce and his faults uh, during his time in office aren't past his own family. Man, that's something. Uh, I'll do my best to make sure my son uh, makes up for it. So sad I miss your shows in Denver. Please come back. And that is sincerely from Sarah, mother of a Pierce. Thanks, Sarah, mother of a Pierce. That was a great email. Yeah, and we'll come back to Denver for sure because sure. we sold out two shows there. Denver loves us. Loves us. Can't get enough of us. The Mile High City. Yes. We'll be back. Um, if you want to get in touch with us, why don't you go ahead and mosey on over to um, stuffyoushouldknow.com. Check out our social links there. I also have a website called the joshclarkway.com if you want to check that out too. That's right. And you can always send me, Jerry, and Chuck an email all at once at stuffpodcast at howstuffworks.com. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit howstuffworks.com. 